I have a sincere passion for physical fitness, which began when I was 12 years old. That was the first time I picked up a set of dumbbells and just started lifting weights. Looking back, I can't quite recall what it was that caused me to start exercising, but it wasn't long before I realized how invigorating and rejuvenating a good workout could be. I was so proud of myself when I saw that I could lift heavier and heavier weights, and even prouder when I surprised my parents by carrying the heaviest bags of groceries home from the supermarket. To this day, exercise in almost all of its forms is one of my favorite activities. It helps me to de-stress, to focus, and as corny as this sounds, to just feel alive. But as I've progressed through my teens and 20s, I've noticed that for many women my age, exercise is not a joy. Some women exercise because they feel pressure to be thinner, tighter, to look more like the women on the covers of Self Magazine or Victoria's Secret. They look at their bodies and see everything they want to change, every patch of cellulite they wish they could just send into the oblivion, provided that they find the right kickboxing or dance class. And even if they are successful at destroying that cellulite, there's usually something else that's not perky enough or too flabby. To them, exercise is a way to eliminate every ugly thing they think they see staring back at them in the mirror. I believe that many of the women in this room, myself included, have felt this way at some point in our lives. When Exercise is done for these reasons, to kill that fat or destroy that food. It does not bring relief or satisfaction or accomplishment. Exercising for these reasons only perpetuates the negative body image and self-worth issues that are plaguing women today, that are tearing us apart. It's sad, but we are not taught to exercise because it makes us feel good. Because running outside with the wind rushing through your lungs is a beautiful experience. We are taught to exercise because our thighs might be too jiggly. That it's a grave humiliation if someone notices that we have fat on our bodies, even though this fat is necessary for our very survival. Instead of giving us life and energy, this kind of exercise depletes our self-esteem and makes us feel small. We need to stop exercising in a vain attempt to make our bodies look perfect. We need to exercise in order to be healthy, to feel strong. As women, we need to reclaim the right to be proud of how our bodies are unique. And exercising is a key element of this. You don't need to exercise in order to look like a Victoria's Secret model. You don't need to look like anyone else other than yourself. The most important thing is to make sure that your body can do the things that you would like it to do. So, the next time that you are running on the treadmill, or even lifting weights. Remember this, your body is beautiful. Your body is a gift. Thank you.
people say to me, oh, are you doing it because you know you want to change a little something? I'm like, I think if I change more, I'm going to like, dissolve away. <laughs> but it's just like, I've been shaking, I'm shaking my head the whole time because I feel like it. Megan, tell us about your kind of your your work ethic, your practice for each of these speeches. Uh, sure. You know, I guess I'm the type of person that when I come up here and I say something, I really want to be sure that I believe what I say and that I know why I believe it. So, I guess across all of the speech assignments, including this one. This is what some other students have said as well. I made sure that I was passionate about what I was talking about. And in class, people have asked me, you know, what can you do to feel more relaxed? What can you do to not focus on the fear when you're actually in front of an audience and you're speaking? And I think one of the key elements to keep in mind is that you need to choose something that you believe in. Because once you choose something that you believe in, you begin to transfer the anxiety of feeling, oh, I'm not sure if I can say something, oh, I'm not sure if I can do this, to, I believe this, and I really want people to know why this is important, and maybe this can help change their lives. Again, this is so timely for the, the existing class, the 30 odd people who are in the class, because they have to pick a value speech. And this is a mistake that I see often. You think of a story, and then you try to fit it in a speech, versus taking those, those first two or three hours to really think about what is it that I believe. Yeah. That investment is worth it, reiterating on that, and then the story unfolds itself. So I think that's really, really nicely put, Megan. We've had one half of Megan. Let's see how she performed in another completely different brief. <clears throat> Last semester, we started for the first time with a video project, which is speaking for video in four or five minutes. And Megan put this together. Now, keep in mind, this is not a video making or editing class. You barely have a couple of weeks to just go out and do this. There is no training for editing, so do not expect a you know, broadcast quality presentation. But let's see. Let's see how Megan put this film together in her video assignment, which is also, again, timely for, for this class. Sexuality in cinematic history. 
Affection and sexual desire within a homosexual male relationship is clearly portrayed. And homosexuality is treated as a natural phenomenon instead of a sexual aberration or disease, as we can see in the following clip. couple of pointers on, on making a film like this. Yeah, I mean, I think, A, you know, to the extent that you have the time and energy, you should just take this assignment seriously and see it as a very organic, creative process where you can show something that you really care about. It's something you should be doing in speeches, it's something you should be really doing across your whole life. Um, but I think it really pans out well when you do it with this video project. Like the professor said, I had never made a video before, um, but I knew that I liked history, and I knew that it might be interesting to show the different side of history, at least in one particular <coughs> example of it, and might cause people to like history a little more too, or not at least immediately dismiss it as this academic, boring thing full of dates and events and people who live and die, and that's it. Um, so yeah, I think especially for the students who are taking the class this semester, that are considering doing the actual video versus the five questions video, um, just be free about it, be creative about it, and don't be afraid to take risks, and don't feel, don't feel odd if you've never done a video before. That's not, that's not the point. Any thoughts, comments, reactions? Leland? Where did you find the authentic videos? And the second thing is, what was it about Weimar Germany in particular that you wanted to focus on? Um, so A, I just, called the internet because I knew I wanted to find specific video clips. I actually downloaded a lot of different clips and went through them and that one just happened to stand out. So then I edited it down so that I could get really the message across considering that was only you know five minutes or so. The last clip is from the actual movie and I did the same thing basically. I watched the whole thing and I found the aspect of it that I thought that was best illustrating my, my point. Um, and then, in terms of Weimar Germany, I was a history major in college, and I thought it was kind of a understudied, at least in that forum, aspect of, of history. Um, it was something that we barely went over in some of my, my history classes, and I considered that to be an injustice, considering how rich the time period was. So, yeah. Okay, one quick question, Arsla. What um, program did you use for editing? Or because it was a really good quality um, it's just the iMovie. It was just the. It was just iMovie. Yeah, cool. and then I downloaded a separate program where I could, um, I guess, download videos from YouTube and then play around with them and edit them. So I forgot what that was called. What it just said. I can double that me for us. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
This is so exciting. Exciting speech after exciting speech. An Ode to Smell by Atul Ravuniart. Is that right? Is that right? OK, so we were talking about the framing brief right, in class. And I've had all kinds of creative things that we can try to reframe. Reframing smell was one of the more interesting ones we had. Atul thought about this speech systematically, diligently, worked with several da drafts, and then gave us something that we will remember. Atul, just by background, he has spent some time working in India. He's been in Hong Kong, worked overseas, like many of us all over the world. He's a master's in international business student here. And here he is to recreate an ode to smell. So I'm going to be the comic relief for the night. It's uh, <laughs> So why smell? Uh, most of us have very negative connotations of smell. When you think of smell, you think of some things that you don't like and you don't want to think about. And I want to bring a different perspective on how you think about smell. So I'm from India, like Professor said. And uh, I left when I was about 15. I went to boarding school, and I've lived away essentially ever since then. Um, and every year I go back, usually in the summer, once in the winter maybe, if I'm lucky. And uh, you know, I'm from this tiny city in the south called Cochin. And every time I get off the plane in Cochin, it's the exact same thing. The smell doesn't change. The smell is always the same. And uh, if you think about it, and in my mind, the smell is a little warm. It's a little salty. It's a little humid. It smells of coconut trees and greenery and the ocean and all those things. And the most perfect way to describe it is uh, it smells like hot earth that's been freshly watered. That's, that's what I think of when I get out of the plane in India. And uh, it's not about the smell itself, but it's what I feel at that point that's important. I feel comfortable. I'm home. I'm happy. This is where I want to be. And I feel a little sad. I feel sad because of all the time I've spent away from home, all the, all the birthdays I've missed, all the weddings I've missed, and so on and so forth. But the smell is, is what reminds me every time I'm there about what home is. And that's actually something we need to think about. Um, you know, All of us know how a McDonald's fry smells like. We all know exactly how it smells like. But we never think of what emotion that conjures in us. Is it a happy thought? Is it a sad thought? Is it a gross thought? It could be any one of those things, but it's important to think about what it can do for us. When we think about emotions, we usually think about all the other senses with which we um, understand emotion. So it's the uh, love at first sight. It's not love at first smell, it's love at first sight. And it's the sound of summer, and it's a taste of Chicago, and the taste of Boston. But it's never the smells of Chicago, or the smells of Boston, or the smells of, sorry. <laughs> it's not the smells. And that's really sad, I think. Um, when I was doing research for this paper, uh, or this speech, I, I did some research. I thought I was super smart for having come up with this all on my own. But uh, there was actually a study that was done. Uh, the topic, I mean, the paper title was uh, The Hedonic Appreciation and Verbal Description of Smells in Cooks, Florists, and Perfumists. Uh, super technical, super boring. I won't bore you with the details. But the conclusion was fascinating. It said that all of us. Uh, so it was working with a very interesting subset of people, like people who are very attuned to smell. And um, they can all identify smells and categorize smells based on um, pleasantness. So good smell, bad smell, whatever, makes sense. But uh, when probed, they can also talk about the feelings that each of those smell brings. So they won't verbalize it instantly, but if you ask them, oh, what does this smell make you feel like? They can say, oh, it makes me feel happy. It makes me feel sad. It makes me feel like my ex-girlfriend left me, whatever. But the fact is that we have the capacity to attach emotions to these smells, and we don't. We don't verbalize it, we don't think about it. And in our short lives, if we want to live our lives to the fullest, we have to engage all our senses, including smells, including the smells that, including the senses that we take for granted right now. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is one of my favorite novelists, and uh, in Love in the Time of Cholera, he opens with this quote, it was inevitable. The scent of bitter almonds reminded him of unrequited love. 
And, uh, you know, I think that, that says a lot. And I can truly empathize with that. When somebody asks me, oh, do you miss home? You've been away for so long. It's like, yeah, sure, people, family, home, whatever. But, uh, you know, I, I, I miss the smell. That's, that's what I really miss. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't really get sick, so I haven't had a stuffed nose in a very long time, so I'm really glad for that. I think it's because when I was super young, my grandmother fed me this weird concoction of stuff that, like, fattens you up, makes your cheeks big, but you don't get sick after that. Like, especially nasal problems. So, I've been lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, just one comment. Uh, I practice the same kind of because the first thing I do every time I, 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 I get off a plane in a new place that I've never visited before is take a, a big breath and smell the smell of, of, of the place. And if I like it, I just fall in love with the place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One last one. Okay. I'm just going to say thank you very much for a very good speech. And uh, on top of your very good speech, you help uh, remind us to recognize the smallest things in life. Like, for example, you help uh, remind us to think, we think of the smell of fresh fries at McDonald's. That was really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, your point of view. Yeah, so um, that was a very fantastic uh, delivery. Mm -hmm. with so much, you delivered it with so much uh, passion, with so much love and so much composure. So I was wondering whether you had all these uh, characteristics before you joined the class, or it kind of built up along the line. You know what the right answer is, right? Yeah. <laughs> Take the class. No, I mean, I think, uh, I think my biggest challenge was, I, I think I was always comfortable speaking in front of a crowd, but I was never uh, the kind of person to put things down, think about a speech systematically, write down drafts, put the effort and time that was required. And I think that was like my biggest takeaway from the class was that um, the 10 hours. Um, you put in the time, you write drafts, you go through it, you edit it, you, you figure out where you can improve and things along the lines of that. I think that's, that's key, in, for me at least, in terms of delivery. So what's happening is in hour 11 through whatever you guys are putting, you're also seeing incremental improvement. I want to just highlight, I don't think we're noticing, but all our eight speakers to date, there's no notes. And I know it's, it's easier in the class once you get familiar with people, but this is all off book. And Atul, right before waiting for the restroom, you were telling me how nervous you were and that this speech is not going to fit with the others, but it has. I mean, it really has. And, so for high quality, you internalize this process and the learnings, and you've really given us a brilliant speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. All right, all right. Next up, Terry Levine. Terry Levine, give an introduction, please. Terry Levine <laughs> is actually a student from last spring. He took the half semester course last spring, worried about, you know, getting in the class, was so enthusiastic about everything. And I was like, who's the student? You know, it's a lot of exuberance, a lot of enthusiasm. Really decided to take this class seriously, actually spent a, a semester at Dartmouth also, with an exchange program, and he's back here. While this was supposed to be primarily a selection from last semester, he said, you know, I would love to, to recreate it. And the speech that he had given to us on the final day in ASEAN Auditorium last year was literally one of the very best I have heard. It is called Summers on the Jersey Shore, and one year later, here is Terry Levine for us. For the next slide? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think it's this one. Okay. So we just heard about smell, so imagine, okay, we're here, you're smelling the ocean, you're smelling the salt. Okay. Doing my 10 seconds. So every summer, my family would pack up our station wagon and drive two hours south from the suburbs outside New York City to Long Beach Island on the Jersey Shore. Go New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> We would spend the month of August with my mom's family in a small four-bedroom, one-bathroom beach house just a few steps away from the beach. And it's really amazing how we fit my mom's entire family into this small house with two grandparents, 10 aunts and uncles, and 11 grandchildren. 
But luckily, we had two outdoor showers, and in fact, my whole childhood, I don't think I ever showered inside the house. <laughs> so every morning during this month in August, the schedule would always pretty much be the same. We'd wake up early, we'd carry all of our beach toys, beach chairs, whatever, you name it, boogie boards, and we would walk a couple hundred feet to the ocean. We would spend the whole day playing, uh, building sandcastles, getting really pruny after spending, you know, six hours in the salt water, and it was really a wonderful time in my life that was repeated every year. And at night, we would play board games, we would sit around chit-chatting, and really had a great time. What we would always try to do also was convince an adult to take us to the ice cream parlor, which worked probably about 50% of the time because more sugar meant we would be staying up pretty late and the adults wanted to drink a little. So, um, and when it was lights out, we would all roll out our sleeping bags in the living room like a bunch of half Filipino sardines, one after another after another. <laughs> and my dad would tell us a story that he had made up or read from my favorite book, The Stinky Cheese Man, which I'm sure all of you, or a good portion of you, um, have read. And the kids, actually, you know, I mentioned the drinking of the adults. The kids were not the only people having fun, too. I remember one moment vividly when I was probably about nine or ten. My mom was laying on the couch one probably Tuesday or Wednesday morning with a massive headache. And I asked her, Mom, what's, what's wrong? And she was laying back very dramatically saying, Carry too much karaoke and gin and tonics. <laughs> My mom and her siblings, even though there are many of them, genuinely enjoy one another's company and they always have. And that's an important thing that they imparted on us. And unfortunately, to this day, my mom and her sisters still continue to sing at various family parties, gatherings, and on, at beach bars during the summer, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> and it isn't to my time on the Jersey Shore being a really fond memories um, from my childhood. They also informed and helped shape me as a person. I learned many things, including the importance of building family commitments. I would grow up with my cousins, we would go through the whole college admissions process, and I've been in many of their weddings, doing readings, doing different things. And all of my family, this kind of big clan of Filipinos, are really my sounding board to, at any juncture in my life, I can go to anyone. I also learned the importance of respect. My grandmother is the rock that created all of us, and we would spend four weeks together which in a similar time frame, she spent four weeks on a boat coming from Manila to California. So we always learned to cherish her and she's still with us, which is very lucky. I also learned the importance of generosity. So even though, as I've mentioned, the house was literally bursting at the seams, there was always an extra space on the floor for another kid for, you know, who was from a suburb who wanted to come down or a family friend. There was always room for someone. And that is something that has been consistent in my life. My grandma has a funny story um, that uh, one day she met a Filipino at the post office who she had never met before and he said he didn't have a place to live and so he ended up coming home and staying with them which you would normally think would last for about a week but it ended up lasting three years um, and he lived with the family so generosity was always something very important to us and to our clan. So you know as I've mentioned looking forward these memories on the Jersey Shore were uh, my fondest really were and I hope to, to impart that on my future children as well. I believe in summer because it reminds me of sun, which is important in this kind of climate, um, family, and also the values that underpin who I am as a person. Thank you. Terry, how is this coming back after a year? Delivering it. Uh, it's, it's funny, I, uh, I was a little nervous. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that came across, but last, I mean, I, I really loved the class last year, and I spent a lot of time preparing for the speech, and um, I don't know, it, it, it rings true, because it's something that I, I wanted to say something about family, um, and so this, I feel like, encapsulate my, can encapsulate my family, because it's such a driving force in my life. Um, but it was, it was interesting coming back, uh, yeah. One or two 
sardine. Roll and you yeah. Also have like sardines and you know have like two mattresses where you can camp outside. And I really like how with like anecdotes and story you can relate that to the values of your family and how that could shape you as a person. I think that's very important. So I really like this page. Thanks. Nicely put. Yeah, Megan. You are such a beautiful storyteller, and not only that, you have a way of making the learned sound bites sound like poetry. And I feel like I could listen to you tell stories for days, so Thanks. thank you. That was brilliant. Terry, what you have done is illustrated a very important point. A lot of times there's questions and frustration, if you will, in the class that, okay, you're telling us to give these speeches. But you're not telling us how to prepare them. What is the structure for a good value speech? One structure could be, I believe in X, point one, point two, point three. Here is the summary. Well, this was so far away from that structure. Right? It's just sharing stories from the heart. He just needed one sentence at the very end to say, I believe in summers. And that is, that is why this class requires you to bring your creativity, paint on a canvas as you would like, and still give us memorable speeches and beauty as you've done. Terry, all I have for you is another kind bar. I'll eat it. <laughs> but thank you very much for recreating this. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple more to go, guys. I know. I know it's been a good evening, but I'm hoping you're enjoying every moment as I am. You're going to enjoy it now. The next speech title is called where do you poo? <laughs> now, I think there's a lot of class members here. Both Ellen and Sabina will not likely be with us next semester. And they've already given us such outstanding speeches that I think it's, it was right to invite them to, to recreate these for us. So now that you have your team and classmates, a really healthy round of applause for Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And while you're doing this, I should explain to the, the visitors of the class that one of our, I guess, things that we recommend in yeah. class is to make 10 <laughs> seconds of eye contact before you start a speech. So if you're wondering what that was, that, that's what it is. <laughs> Where do you poo? Seriously, that's on us. Where do you poo? <laughs> that makes sense. Let's try someone on the other side of the room. Jack, where do you poo? <laughs> Is it safe to say that everybody in this room generally poos in the toilet when you have the option? Those? Yep, safe to say. Now, I'm guessing you haven't put much thought into why you poo in a toilet, but having poo out in the open is in fact one of the leading causes of diarrhea, which, according to UNICEF, accounts for 9% of the deaths among children under five worldwide. Now, to address this issue, humanitarian agencies across the globe have spent billions of dollars constructing toilets, or what hardened field workers like to call latrines, across all these developing countries. Now, despite similar programs and similar amounts of money being uh, dumped into the country of South Sudan, when I arrived there in August 2012, there was not a single village in the entire country that was what we considered open defecation free. Or, to put that frankly, there was not a single village in the entire country of South Sudan that did not have human poo out in the open. We obviously had a massive problem here, not with getting these toilets to these rural communities, but with actually getting those individuals to then use the toilets. I was part of a team that decided to flip this aid narrative on its head, and rather than continue to construct these latrines in these rural communities, we were going to address the perspectives of poo that was guiding this behavior. And we were going to do that without providing any financial or material aid to these communities whatsoever. But we were going to provide guidance. 
community program workers would go into the villages. This is the village of Adiem. They would gather the whole community together and they would ask each individual to point to their poo as they walked around the village. They would literally ask each individual to point on the ground to where their poo was. <laughs> To push this a little further, they would then ask them to bring a plate of food. They would take this plate of food, put it on the ground next to the pile of poo, and they would ask the nearest child what the flies were doing that were hovering around the poo. They would all start laughing, and if the if people were not sufficiently grossed out by having their poo pointed out to them on the ground, having these young children explain the fact that the flies were carrying the poo to the food and vice versa definitely pushed these perspectives over the edge. Everybody started laughing and giggling and immediately they asked what they could do to solve this problem. Within two meetings, the spear master and all of the women of the town, because most of the men were out in the bush with the cattle or farming, they designed a latrine that they could build by themselves using resources that were available to them. That's the latrine that they came up with for their community. This was around August, end of August 2012. Within four months, every single household in this village had at least one latrine that they could use, but more importantly, every single individual in this village was using these latrines. On 1st of November 2012, I was in Adia. I had the pleasure to be there with the governor, the state governor, the USAID representative, all these big wigs. But we were not there to celebrate our solution. We were there to celebrate the difficult journey of drastically changing perspectives on something as mundane as poo. <laughs> we were there to celebrate this community and we were more importantly there to celebrate a sustainable solution to a safer and healthier South Sudan that does not have to rely on or wait for the well-intentioned foreigners. So next time you go to the bathroom, think about it. Where do you poo? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Comments, reactions? Most people have heard it already. <laughs> yeah. Let's get a volunteer from our guest, from the undergrad guest. What did you think of, uh, of this speech? Yes. I thought it was really good. It offered not only an interesting perspective, but it was clearly well practiced and well delivered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. out of the ballpark when you barely had a couple of weeks to digest the material, deal with your nervousness, and give such quality to us. It's again a great pleasure. I know that each of your classmates enjoyed hearing this. And honestly, I would love to hear this over and over again. It's such an important <laughs> message, and you deliver it brilliantly. Thank you. Kind bar. <laughs> okay, Sabina, reframing. have it here. So I had the pleasure of working with Sabina last year and she was actually interviewing for consulting and then I meet with a lot of students to help them coach them before their consulting interviews and I was you know amongst all these brilliant students that actually get the, the interviews I was so impressed with with Sabina and, and how she internalized learnings immediately. I was absolutely thrilled when you, when you took this class. Already you've given us a, a speech that is worth recreating. Sabina is half German, half Rwandan, yeah. and that's it, right? 
<laughs> Sound bite. Okay, wait. And she's lived in these countries and also in Singapore. You went in Hong Kong. You went to school there. She's lived and traveled around the world. Here she is for us. So I consider myself a life science geek. So I'm actually really excited to be reframing the pharmaceutical industry for you today. And that's not only because in my free time I actually follow the industry very closely like a real geek, but also professionally I've decided to join the life science industry after graduating from Fletcher. I'm sure as many of you here in the audience who are looking at different options as to what to do after graduating from Fletcher, any future careers and what the plans will be once you march in, in May, I wanted to make sure that I would join an industry that actually benefits society. So as the life science geek in me, but also as the Fletcher humanitarian, I will explain to you why I, why I think that the pharmaceutical industry creates healthy and richer societies. And now I need the clicker. Actually, I have it here. With you. Okay. Um, oops. Okay. So, firstly, is because pharma is saving the world, and that's not just me saying this, but it is actually the Business Inside magazine that takes ten companies every year and ranks them for their um, potential to save the world. And what's interesting is that of these 10 companies, five of them are actually in the pharmaceutical industry. Now don't ask me why Chipotle is also in there. <laughs> now what's important to remember here is that no other industry has as much of a representation as the pharmaceutical industry for actually making a difference in the world. Secondly, pharma creates healthy and richer societies. And that's because the industry eradicates diseases. So let's take polio, for example. Within two decades, the pharmaceutical industry was basically able to eradicate polio and reduce the number of cases worldwide by over 99%. And that makes us healthier and more productive and able to contribute to a good economy. Secondly, it relieves health systems and taxpayers. So by developing drugs, that actually prevent patients from having to go to hospitals and having huge hospitalization expenses, they're actually able to, to prevent these hospitalization expenses and ultimately save us as taxpayers a lot of money, actually $1 billion every year. Now having said that, what makes the pharmaceutical industry similar to any other industry out there is that they're outliers. So they're companies like GlaxoSmithKline, British pharmaceutical company that recently in the summer uh, fell under corruption allegations for bribing doctors in China. Now I will leave that up to you, the Fletcher diplomat, the Fletcher humanitarian or even undergrad humanitarian and the Fletcher business person to tell me, can we uh, forgive a company that has bribed doctors in China in order to stay competitive but at the same time is actually currently developing a vaccine against malaria that could potentially save a million lives all over the world. Can we forgive them? I will leave that up to you. All I wanted to do is give you my definition of the pharmaceutical industry, an industry that saves lives and creates healthy and richer societies. So again, as context for this, this was a reframing speech. So as part of the speech's brief, she, sh she would, should not have brought up the existing frames related to large companies. And that's why this, this was the structure of the presentation. Antanas? Yeah. First, thanks for not asking me where I put. Um, <laughs> where do you buy your drugs? <laughs> Second, excellent delivery and presentation. I almost like the pharma uh, industry now. Uh, third, maybe you have a role, but I was wondering, since it's a reframing speech, why did you decide not to say how you, what is the view that you want to shift our perception from? Is that what you always do? Because you mentioned it at the end, in a way you kind of use the criticism to emphasize your point, why did you do that? 
at the end and not in the beginning. So one of the, the things that, so we, we were supposed to read this chapter on what framing is about. And one of the things that uh, they say is that you're not supposed to bring it, you basically, you're supposed to take, uh, so let's say the pharmaceutical industry and associate like positive things for it. That's what I want to, to bring out. So if you bring up a negative image, that might actually sort of destroy that positive association that you have with, like you, you want to completely like redefine something. Yeah. Yeah, if someone asks as the title of the book, don't think of an elephant. Exactly. The first thing you will think of is an elephant. And when they said, Richard Nixon said, I'm not a crook, that's the first image that came, came to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lisa. Thanks, Alina, for this great speech. Um, I really like that you changed a little. <laughs> I did. I um, incorporated the. <laughs> you, you took our feedback on the future debuters thing and <laughs> the sound bites. So I think it was great that you could change it and adapt it to what we had said. So, Lina, the semester's just begun. You have two more speeches to deliver, and we look forward to what you'll have to share with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is Joel here? Joel, okay, hold on. The, folks, last time there was, a, there was a moment in last semester's class when Joel delivered the, the last speech of the day that we're going to hear. Okay, let me pull him up so you can see him. That's Joel Al Kalkili. And there was, it was the end of the evening, and there were only a few people there. And then we heard Joel delivering the speech, and everyone was like, You had to be there. You had to be there. Also because of what we had seen of Joel in the class before and the first speech that he had delivered, which was such a structured, direct speech that he gave. And we heard this speech from Joel. There was a chance that he was not going to make it with an existing appointment, but he's back here for us. The very last, the twelfth speech of the night, presenting Mr. Joel L. Kalkili. Hi everyone. I admit it. I'm a simple person. I like simple things. I like simplicity. Sometimes being simple really pays off. When I was 11 years old I started rowing. Well, this is a fairly complex sequence of motion. It is highly repetitive. You do the same thing over and over. Doing this for 15 years on a daily basis, a couple of hours a day, requires a simple mind. I was pretty good at it. <laughs> and I did it competitively. The biggest asset you can have for a roaring race is a talent for simplicity. You need to accept the race as an existential matter. All that exists and counts in the world is what happens within those six minutes of the race. You stop thinking. It's made for simple people. I really loved it. <laughs> Apart from sports, I had to suffer complexity to embrace simplicity. Two years ago I moved from Frankfurt to Berlin. Shouldn't be too complicated, I thought. I didn't need much, I didn't have much. It turned out it was a bit complicated. I had gathered incredibly large amounts of nice little things in my Berlin apartment. Completely useless on a day-to-day, -day, highly impractical if you want to move. I had also spun a complex web of contracts around myself. Telephone, television, cable, newspapers, magazines. Terminating all those contracts took around 1,000 phone calls, emails and letters, most of which I had to send multiple times. Did I really need and enjoy all those things? Or had I just created unnecessary complexity? When I moved to Frankfurt, I expected a fully furnished and ideally clean apartment. Turned out it was neither clean nor furnished. <laughs> it was completely empty. Not completely empty. There was one tiny little fridge in the kitchen. Then there was one room with a tiny little mattress on the floor, the bedroom. And then there was another room with a single chair. <laughs> Presumably that was the sitting room. <laughs> So, at first I was really angry, but then it turned out it was just perfect like it was. It was uncomplicated, it was very simple. 
I had left everything in Berlin for nothing in Frankfurt, and not once did I miss a thing. Um, I actually started to like my new simple lifestyle so much that I playfully ventured into further simplification. When I entered my apartment, I switched my phone off. I was not available anymore. And since I wasn't using the sitting room that much, I took the little chair into my bedroom and used it as a little shelf for my humble belongings that were previously stored in my little backpack. The little backpack was now empty and I used it as a laundry bag right next to the door to the apartment. <laughs> Every Friday night, my kind neighbor would pick it up and bring it back cleaned Saturday morning, not later than 9 a.m. It was very convenient, it was very uncomplicated and very simple. On my last day in Frankfurt, I took my little backpack with all my belongings, turned around, uh, shut the door behind myself with a smile on my face, and left Frankfurt knowing that I would from now on keep things very simple and be happy. That was a good observation about the sitting room. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts, comments on this speech? Joel, Usman. The speech was very simple. <laughs> <laughs> How did you keep it like that? You didn't bring in anything complex or so. I mean, it was, it was very fluent at the same time, it was so simple. Yeah, I think the, the first uh, speech I had a bit too complicated for myself, and this one was quite easy. I started with the rowing thing, which was very natural for me, and the simple thing was something I really liked about my time in Frankfurt. So. I didn't really think too much about the. But had thing. you thought this through, or was this, I mean, this thought already in your mind, and you just decided to voice it in your speech, or did you think of a topic later and then sort of constructed this melody? No, I was sitting down thinking about something, and then this came quite naturally. I wanted to take something which is natural for me. The other stuff was a bit not so natural. Thank you. And the first speech we had, I remember we spoken during office hours, where you said that it was so serious, and let me try something that's not not that serious and this was brilliant in that sense you know it's well thought of made us laugh and got your point across any other thoughts you have I have two two questions actually first one is you I actually see what you said you believe in what you said but my question is do you really believe in what you said like deep you not just about the sake of presentation and second is when you have you mention simple, something that is a not practical in in, in a real sense. Do what in a simple. What about the clothing? That how many how how much clothing is like enough to to be a simple? And, uh, I think um, one of the things I like about my stay here at Fletcher's, I really have only one sports bag with all my stuff in it. And I don't need more than two or three pants, so that's what I think is simple in terms of clothing. And um, <laughs> the, the the reason I, I, I like I ask this is because people people tell me I also like a simple things. People tell me one time I went to a uh, to a shopping and I, the <coughs> one of my classmates asked me, "Hey, your bomb from from far behind." Uh, Call me and then I came back to me and said the first thing he said was, I recognize because I, I, I see I recognize your coat, but because I always wear the same things, the, the overcoat. And then my wife tell me that, see, because like everybody, when you see people say that coat, like everybody says that. <laughs> We're used to seeing in colors, in the same colors. <laughs> Ah, well, Joel, thank you for, for really going out of the way to, to come back to us. Well, it has been a long evening. What I'd love to do is ask all 12 of the speakers who have gone out of the way to give us this time, please come on stage and we will give you, we'll take a picture and give you a, a nice final round of applause. So please, all 12 of you, on stage.
Turn it off. Now.